This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to Kalam Institute's podcast series, Sirah, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at kalaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kalam Institute. Bismillahi walhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. So inshallah continuing with our study of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We've, in the last few sessions, we've been going through the ahadith on, about the night of al-Isra al-Mi'raj. And as I explained at the beginning of when we kind of when we started, um, you know, studying the, this night and the journey of the Prophet ﷺ, there are numerous ahadith uh, related to the incident of al-Isra al-Mi'raj. And some of the scholars, some of the classical scholars of Sirah, uh, such as the author of Subulul Huda wa Rashad, one of probably the most um, uh, comprehensive and detailed uh, collections of the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. What they've basically done is that they t- they've taken all the authentic narrations, compiled them together, omit, uh, then they've omitted the repetition and pieced it together to basically create a general sequence of events. And that's kind of how we're going through the journey of Al-Isra Al-Mi'raj. Otherwise, there are numerous, numerous traditions in a hadith because whether the Prophet ﷺ either you know, informed the Sahaba about the experiences of that night on different occasions, as was relevant to different circumstances, whether that was the case, or maybe it was just simply the fact that certain Sahaba were able to latch on to certain details from the overall journey of the Prophet ﷺ, and they were able to narrate <coughs> a certain part of the story in either case, in either scenario, um, that is generally the nature of the narrations about Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. But we're kind of going through it comprehensively. So the last session that we had, we covered the details where the Prophet ﷺ completes the journey of Al-Isra. There are two parts to this night. Al-Isra, the journey by night from Mecca to Jerusalem, wal Mi'raj, and the ascension above the heavens. In the previous session, we completed the journey of Al-Isra. The Prophet ﷺ reaches Jerusalem. He enters Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, Bayt Al-Maqdis. And there the Prophet ﷺ and Jibreel ﷺ offer two rakahs of prayer as is the right of every house of Allah upon the believer who attends there. And then the narration goes on to tell us that all of the souls of the Anbiya alayhim salam have been gathered there for the Prophet sallallahu And there, the, we mentioned last time that Jibreel alayhi tells the Prophet sallallahu that these are all the prophets and messengers of God that Allah has sent throughout time up until you. And the second narration mentions that the Prophet sallallahu was able to actually recognize a few of them. Some of them seemed familiar to the Prophet sallallahu and that was definitely through the familiarity that he had developed through divine revelation and the fact that they belonged to the same brotherhood, the same fraternity. In either case, and, and I mentioned last time how the hadith of the Musnad of Imam Ahmad mentioned the fact that there are a hundred thousand, some narrations say three hundred thousand prophets that were sent throughout time, al So that means all of them were gathered. So you can imagine how filled the space was and how you know exciting and empowering it must have been for the Prophet ﷺ to see 300, if we saw 300,000 people, let alone 300,000 Muslims, we'd be blown away. It'd be so overwhelming, so empowering. But then imagine 300,000 Prophets of Allah. So it was such an empowering moment. It was such a moment of just, ful- it was such a fulfilling and satisfying, gratifying occasion. Where the Prophet ﷺ did not need any vindication. The Prophet ﷺ was a pillar of conviction. He believed in the message that he was preaching and teaching. But nevertheless, you know, with all the difficulty and all the adversity that he had been facing for so long, you can imagine how empowering it must have been. How gratifying it must have been. 
How fulfilling it must have been that the people in Mecca can say whatever they want, but look at here, look at this. Every single prophet throughout the history of mankind is gathered here together to congratulate me, to welcome me, to appreciate me. And so that, that definitely had a very powerful impact on the Prophet ﷺ. And so now the narration goes on to mention, and we talked about this last time, that then one narration specifically says, Jibreel alayhi salam called the adhan, and then stepped forward and called the, called the iqama. And after that, all, all of the anbiya who were present, they're lined up in their sufuf, in their lines. And the narration actually mentions, فَتَدَافَعُوا That they kind of kept deferring to one another, you lead, no you lead, no you lead, no you lead. And they started asking amongst one another who's going to lead. One narration says that it even became kind of awkward for a moment. Nobody know, knew who should step forward and who should lead. حَتَّى قَدَّمُوا مُحَمَّدًا Two narrations. One narration says that they, the anbiya themselves said, Muhammad wasallam should lead. And then Jibreel alayhi salam, since he was the one who called the iqama, he went over, grabbed the Prophet ﷺ by his hand, and pulled him forward into the position of the imam to lead the prayer. And then the Prophet ﷺ led the prayer, and afterwards, Jibreel alayhi salam says, "Kullu nabiyyin ba'athahu Allahu Taala qad sallu khalfak." That each and every single prophet that Allah had ever sent just prayed behind you. Now that the prayer is over and everyone is sitting there. In the narration that is mentioned by Imam Hakim in his Mustadrak and Imam Bayhaqi in his Sunan, uh, and this is an authentic narration, it's authenticated. Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu relates that the Prophet sallallahu said, then said, فَلَقِيَ أَرْوَاحَ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ That he met all the souls of the Prophets. فَأَثْنَوْا عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ And then all the Prophets after praying together, they began to speak of the praises of their Lord. They began to praise and glorify Allah. فَقَالَ Ibrahim. And so this is a really fascinating conversation. So now it's almost like prayer is done and they ha they're having kind of like, you know the post salah khatira, reflection, reminder. This is a reminder being given by prophets to prophets. So Ibrahim alayhi salam speaks first. And he says, Alhamdulillah alladhi ittakhadhani khalilan. That the ultimate praises are for Allah who took me as his best friend. وَأَعْطَانِي مُلْكًا عَظِيمًا And He granted me a very vast kingdom. وَجَعَلَنِي أُمَّةً قَانِتًا يُؤْتَمُّ بِي And He made me a nation that is obedient and submissive before God. And the word ummah, ummatan qanitan as the Qur'an refers to Ibrahim a.s. Even though the word ummah typically means a nation, like a group of people, the Mufassirun described that ummah, here refers to being a leader of people and being a teacher of good to people, that being someone that people can follow. Yu'tammu bi, who, that I was followed by, you know, mankind. Wa anqadhani min an nar, and he saved me, protected me from the fire. Which of course he's talking about the fire that was lit as a punishment for him and he was thrown into, but Allah protected him. Wa ja'alaha alayya bardan wa salaman, and he made it cool and peaceful for me. Thumma inna Musa athna ala rabbihi tabaraka wa ta'ala faqal. Now that Ibrahim alayhi salam completes his, his reflection, Musa alayhi salam speaks up and he praises and glorifies Allah and then faqal and then he says, Alhamdulillah alladhi kallamani taklima. That the ultimate praise is for Allah who directly, audibly spoke to me. وَجَعَلَ هَلَاكَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَنَجَاتَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ عَلَى يَدِي and he made me the means of destroying Fir'aun and saving Banu Israel. He made me the direct means, the direct means of destroying the greatest enemy of God, Fir'aun, and he made me the direct means of saving tens of thousands of believers, the children of prophets, awladul anbiya, who are Banu Israel. وَجَعَلَ مِنْ أُمَّتِي قَوْمًا يَهْدُونَ بِالْحَقِّ وَبِهِ يَعْدِلُونَ And He made from my followers, from my ummah people, who followed the truth, and they established justice on the earth through that truth. ثُمَّ إِنَّ دَاوُودَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ أَثْنَى عَلَى رَبِّهِ Now Dawood alayhi salam speaks up. And he says, Alhamdulillah الذي جعل لي ملكا عظيما The ultimate praises for Allah who made for me a very vast, great, powerful kingdom. وَعَلَّمَنِي الزَّبُورَ And he taught me the sacred text, the Psalms of David, the Zabur. 
wa alana li al hadida and he made uh, iron very soft in my hands meaning he gave me mastery over minerals and irons wa sakhara li al jibala yusabbihna wa tayr that then and he also made the mountains submissive before me so that when I would praise God, I would praise Allah, the mountains and the birds would praise Allah along with me. وَأَعْطَانِي الْحِكْمَةِ وَفَصْلَ الْخِطَابِ And He granted me wisdom and the ability to address people properly. ثُمَّ إِنَّ سُلَيْمَانَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ أَثْنَى عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِ Now Sulaiman عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ speaks up. And he says, أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي سَخَّرَ لِي الْرِيَاحَ وَسَخَّرَ لِي الشَّيَاطِينَ وَالْإِنْسِ يَعْمَلُونَ لِي مَا شِئْتُ مِنْ مَحَارِيبِ وَتَمَاثِيلِ وَجِفَانٍ كَالْجَوَابِ وَقُدُورِ الرَّاسِيَاتِ and basically speaking from reference of the verses of the Qur'an, Sulaiman salam says the ultimate praises for Allah, who's made submissive to me, who subjugated for me, put under my control the winds. And he put the shayateen, the evil jinn under my control. He put human beings under my command. And they would do whatever it is that I wanted them to do. From building things um, like, like palaces and sculptures and diving into the ocean and bringing out pearls and gems and minerals, that whatever it is that I asked them to do, that they would do it. وَعَلَّمَنِي مَنْتِقَ الطَّيْرِ وَآتَانِي مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ فَضْلًا and he taught me the speech of birds. Basically, he gave me the ability to communicate with animals. And he granted me more than you can imagine from each and every single type of thing. وَسَخَّرَ لِي جُنُودَ الشَّيَاطِينَ and he put under my control the armies of the evil jinn, wal ins and human beings, wa tayr and birds, wa faddalani ala kathirin min ibadihi al-mu'mineen. And he granted me, you know, uh, virtue over many of his believing slaves. Wa atani mulkan adiman la yambari li ahadim min badi. And he granted me such a kingdom that is not fit for anyone after me. Wa jala mulki mulkan tayyiban laysa fihi hisa wa la iqab. And he made my kingdom such a kingdom that there will be a beautiful kingdom, that there was no restriction in it, nor was there any type of repercussions of it, bad repercussions or a bad, out, bad outcome of it. ثُمَّ إِنَّ عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ أَثْنَى عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَىٰ فَقَالْ Now Isa عليه السلام, Isa ibn Maryam, he speaks up and he says, Alhamdulillahi الَّذِي جَعَلَنِي كَلِمَتُهُ وَجَعَلَ مَثَلِي مَثَلَ آدَمْ خَلَقَهُ مِن تراب. That the ultimate praises for Allah who made me His word. That's basically an expression that's used in the Qur'an calling Isa alayhi the word of Allah which means He is the miraculous outcome of the command of Allah. Born without a father, He is the miraculous consequence, outcome, manifestation of the command of God. وَجَعَلَ مَثَلِي مَثَلَ Adam, And he made my example, the example of Adam alayhi salam, that just like Adam alayhi salam was given creation, given life miraculously, I was also given life miraculously. خَلَقَهُ مِن تراب, He created Adam alayhi salam from, from clay, from dust. ثُمَّ قَالَ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ And then he said to him, be and he was. وَعَلَّمَنِي الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ And Allah taught me, Isa alayhi salam says, Allah taught me the book and wisdom. And some of the scholars mentioned that what's meant by book and wisdom is similar in the case of the Prophet sallallahu that I was given divine revelation in Jeel. And then wisdom is how to live that book. The sunnah of Isa alayhi salam. Some other scholars mention that in the case of Isa alayhi salam, al-kitab refers to the Torah, and the hikmah refers to the Injil, the, the, the gospel that was revealed to uh, Isa alayhi salam. In either case, Allah ta'ala Allah ta a'lam. وَالتَّوْرَاةَ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ And the Torah and the Injil. وَجَعَلَنِي أُبْرِئُ الْأَكْمَهَ وَالْأَبْرَصَ وَأُحْيِي الْمَوْتَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ and he made me such that I am able to cure somebody who is born blind, and I am able to cure the leper, and I am able to revive the dead all by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. وَرَفَعَنِي وَطَهَّرَنِي 
and he elevated me, he raised me and he purified me. وَأَعَاذَنِي وَأُمِّي مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And Allah protected me and my mother from shaitan who is dejected. فَلَمْ يَكُنْ لِلشَّيْطَانِ عَلَيْنَا سَبِيلٍ And shaitan never had any access to us. Shaitan was never given any type of access to me or my mother. Now, so many different prophets of Allah have spoken up in this manner, very beautifully. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ So now the Prophet ﷺ speaks up. And he says, كُلُّكُمْ أَثْنَى عَلَىٰ رَبِّهِ وَإِنِّي مُثْنٍ عَلَىٰ رَبِّي He said, each and every single one of you has praised his or her, uh, in this case it's all anbiya, each and every single one of you has praised his Lord, so now I will praise my Lord. فَقَالَ أَلْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَنِي رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ وَكَافَةً لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا He said the ultimate praises for Allah who sent me as a mercy for all of mankind. And He made me for all of mankind a deliverer of good news, a congratulator of mankind, and a warner to all of mankind. وَأَنزَلَ عَلَيَّ الْفُرْقَانَ فِيهِ تِبْيَانُ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And He revealed, sent down to me, upon me, the distinguisher between right and wrong, that clearly defines and explains everything. وَجَعَلَ أُمَّتِي خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ And He made my followers, the best of all nations and followers, who were brought out, extracted for the benefit of mankind. وَجَعْلَ أُمَّتِي وَسَطًا And He made my followers, my ummah, my nation, a very balanced people. وَجَعْلَ أُمَّتِي هُمُ الْأَوَّلُونَ وَالْآخِرُونَ And He made my followers the first and the last. The first to enter paradise, and the last to come into this world. وَشَرَحَ لِي صَدْرِي And He expanded and opened my chest. He gave me clarity and confidence. وَوَضَى عَنِّي وِزْرِي and he removed my burdens from me. He lightened my load. He supported me. وَرَفَ Ali ذِكْرِي And he elevated my mention. He made it so that whenever any believer all across the world for centuries to come will ever mention my name, they will send peace and blessings upon me. صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَجَعَلَنِي فَاتِحًا وَخَاتِمًا And he made me the opener and he made me the seal. He made me the opening and he made me the closing. He made me the one who will open the, uh, the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to all of humanity, all across the world. You can travel to any place. I was just talking to the brother who was telling me that he moved here from Maine. And due to the fantastic uh, educational system we have in America, most people don't even know where that is. Right? But <laughs> it's, it's the northernmost part, uh, northernmost part of the United States. That there's a community there, and that's still okay within America. You might imagine that, or maybe you didn't. You can go to any part of the world, and you'll find believers there. You'll find people praying there. You'll find Muslims there. Any part of the world. So he, he, the Prophet ﷺ says, He made me the opening, the one who will open the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to each and every single part of the world. وَخَاتِمًا But He also made me a seal, the closing of the door of nubuwa and prophethood. This is what the Prophet ﷺ says. فَقَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ So Ibrahim عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ says at this, وَبِهَذَا فَضَلَكُمْ مُحَمَّدٌ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَامُ And he says, this is why Muhammad ﷺ has the most virtue amongst all of you. This is the status of Muhammad ﷺ amongst all of you. That this is why Allah has chosen him for this task. So this again shows the honor, the distinction, and just how empowering you know, I was just kind of thinking about this that after everything the Prophet ﷺ had been dealing with in Makkah, just imagine what that must have felt like. Just imagine what that moment must have felt like. To sit with all the Prophets in a room, and then to be asked to lead them all in prayer. And then to sit and converse with them. And then to have someone like Ibrahim ﷺ, somebody that you look up to, someone that you admire, Someone that you named, you, you would name your son after. Then to have such a man, such a great man, that you are the outcome of his dua, you are the continuation of his legacy. He set the foundation that you have come to complete. To have that man say, you are the most exalted, you are the most virtuous, you are the highest ranking out of all of us. 
Just imagine how powerful of an experience that must have been for the Prophet ﷺ. Now the prophets are sitting there, so of course they have a conversation amongst them. So they talk about the hour, the end of times, the day of judgment. They all talked about the day of judgment, and then they basically deferred to Ibrahim alayhi salam, that why don't you please tell us what you think. فَقَالَ لَا عِلْمَ لِي بِهَا لَا عِلْمَ لِي بِهَا He says, I have no knowledge of when the day of judgment will occur. فَرَدُّوا أَمْرَهُمْ إِلَى مُوسَى عَلَيْهِ السلام. Then they turned to Musa alayhi salam. فَقَالَ لَا عِلْمَ لِي بِهَا He says, I have no idea. فَرَدُّوا أَمْرَهُمْ إِلَى عِيسَى عَلَيْهِ السلام. Then they turned to Isa alayhi salam. فَقَالَ أَمَّا وَجْبَتُهَا فَلَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا اللَّهِ So now, Isa alayhi salam basically says that as far as when exactly it will happen, no one knows except for Allah. But he adds something here. Why? Because Isa alayhi salam will play a major role in the events that will unfold at the end of times, in the events preceding the Day of Judgment. That a lot of times, you know, especially, uh, uh, I always caution people, be very careful about how you look up things, especially when you go online, that you'll find all different types of ideas and notions. So there's this contention amongst uh, more contemporary Islam, you know, more contemporary um, ideas and thoughts, and um, and this basically stems from, you know, skepticism and rejection of hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that they basically argue about Isa salam not coming back or not returning or whatever the case may be. Clear, authentic narrations of this nature, of this type, sub, you know, very substantially established the fact that Isa alayhi salam will return back at the end of times. And this is something foretold to us by the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So Isa alayhi salam, now he elaborates because he will play a role. He says, وَفِيمَا عَاهِدَ إِلَيَّ Rabbi." He said, from what my Lord has told me, instructed me, promised me, أَنَّ الدَّجَّالَ خَارِجٌ Dajjal, the Antichrist will come. وَمَعِيَ قَضِيبَانِ And I will have two sticks. فَإِذَا رَآنِي ذَابَ كَمَا يَذُوبُ الرَّصَاصِ And when he sees me, when Dajjal sees me, he will melt just like iron melts when it's put in the fire. He will melt just like iron melts when it's put in the fire. فَيَهْلِكُهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِذَا رَآنِي Allah will destroy him when he sees me. حَتَّى إِنَّ الْحَجَرَ لَيَقُولْ Even so much so that even a stone will say, يَا مُسْلِمْ إِنَّ تَحْتِ كَافِرْ فَتَعَالَ فَاقْتُلْهُ That even so much so that even the stones will say at that time, when the truth will be established at the end of times, that... Even a stone will say that, Oh, believer in God, there is a disbeliever under me, so come and get him. فَيَهْلِكُهُمُ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ يَرْجِعُ النَّاسِ إِلَىٰ بِلَادِهِمْ وَأَوْطَانِهِمْ And then Allah will basically uh, destroy these people who have opposed the religion of God, the truth from Allah, until people will finally return back to their homes and their, their lands. فَعِنْدَ ذَلِكَ يَخْرُجْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ And at that time, once people have returned home and enjoyed peace for some time, يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ will come out. This is a creation of Allah that basically has been stored away, locked away and hidden by Allah, that this creation will be unleashed upon the earth. وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ That from every hill you will see them flowing down, just like water flows down when it floods. When water hits and it floods and I see water flowing down the hill, just in that way waves of these of this creation of Allah will come flowing down the hills. فَيَطَعُونَ بِلَادَهُمْ لَا يَأْتُونَ عَلَى شَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَهْلَكُهُ That they will basically crush and crumble and cover each and every single part of the land. So much so that whenever they come upon anything, they will destroy it. وَلَا يَمُرُّونَ عَلَى مَا إِلَّا شَرِبُهُ Whenever they come across any body of water, they will completely consume it all, they will drink it all. ثُمَّ يَرْجِعُ النَّاسِ فَيَشْكُونَهُمْ إِلَيَّا that then the people will return back to me, to Isa alayhi salam. The people, the believers will gather together again. And they will complain to me. Isa alayhi salam says they will come to me. And they will say, what are we supposed to do? They're ravaging the earth. 
فَأَدْعُوا اللَّهَ تَعَالَى عَلَيْهِمْ I will make dua to Allah against this creation. فَيَهْلِكُهُمْ وَيُمِيتُهُمْ The other narrations kind of give some more context that the believers will basically escape up to the mountains and live up in the mountains. But even after living there for quite some time, they will grow weary and tired of this. They will run out of food. They will face a lot of hardship. And then Isa alayhi salam says, I will make dua to Allah. Allah will kill them. This, this creation of God that is devouring the earth, Allah will destroy them and kill them. حَتَّى تَحْوِي الْأَرْضَ مِنْ رِيحِهِمْ That basically the entire earth will be covered with their dead bodies and it will begin to stink and stench because of their rotting corpses. فَيُنزِلُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْمَطَرَ There's another narration that also says that birds will come in and pick up their dead bodies and throw them away into the oceans. But the, and then it will rain. فَيُنزِلُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى الْمَطَرَ It will rain. Some narrations mention it will rain up to 40 days, continuously washing, cleansing the earth. فَيَجْرِفُ أَجْسَادَهُمْ حَتَّى يَقْضِفُهُمْ فِي الْبَحْرِ That basically that's what it mentions, that their bodies will be thrown into the ocean. فَفِيمَا عَهِدَ إِلَيْ رَبِّي أَنَّ ذَلِكَ إِذَا كَانَ كَذَلِكَ That, and my Lord told me that when all of this has happened, فَإِنَّ سَاعَتَكَ الْحَامِلَ الْمُتِمِ That then the hour, the day of judgment, will be like a pregnant, will, the example of that will be like a pregnant female whose term of pregnancy has completed. لَا يَدْرِي أَهْلُهَا مَتَى تَفْجَأَهُمْ بِوِلَادَتِهَا لَيْلًا وَنَهَرًا that the family of that female, of that woman who is pregnant, who has completed her term of pregnancy, the family does not know when they will be shocked, when they will be surprised by the birth of the child. Will it happen at night? Will it happen in the morning? Nobody knows. But how like everyone waits on pins and needles, that then when all of these events have unfolded and realized it could happen at any moment, the Day of Judgment could unfold. وَأَخَذَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ مِنَ الْعَطْشِ مَا أَشَدَّ مَا أَخَذَهُ So after this conversation occurs, the narration goes on to mention that the Prophet ﷺ sits there for a while longer in Baytul Maqdis in Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, and he becomes extremely thirsty. And the Prophet ﷺ recalls that he had never felt such thirst in his entire life, and he lives in the desert. But he had never felt such thirst in his entire life. فَأُوتِيَ بِقَدْحَيْنِ So it's one narration mentions that two bowls were brought to him. But the more authentic narration, and there are multiple narrations, it mentions that three bowls were brought to the Prophet ﷺ, three cups. And the narration actually, one of them even mentions, مُغَطَّاتٍ أَفْوَاهَهَا That the, 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 the mouths or the tops of the bowls were covered. So three bowls were brought to him, or three cups were brought to him, and all three of them were covered. And they were brought to the Prophet ﷺ. One was on the right, one was in the middle, one was on the left. The Prophet ﷺ takes the first one and drinks from it. And some of the narrations say that had water in it, but majority of the narrations mention that it had honey in it. The, the first cup on the right had honey in it. And the Prophet ﷺ took a small sip from it, and then he gave it back. The middle bowl that the Prophet ﷺ moved on to next, he takes it and he begins drinking from it, realizing that it has milk in it. And the Prophet ﷺ drinks the entire bowl of milk until he becomes full. And then he gives it back. And then the third bowl, which is then pushed forward to him, he doesn't even touch it. He doesn't even take it. He says, no, no, I'm good. I'm completely full, no thank you. And he just refuses to even take it. One of the narrations mentioned that Ibrahim is sitting there watching all of this. It describes him as a very elderly, handsome, you know, very honorable, distinguished looking man. And then he says that, you know, you've, you've done the right thing. And another narration mentions that Jibreel a.s. comes to the Prophet ﷺ, He grabs the Prophet ﷺ by the shoulders. You know when you congratulate someone and you pat them on the shoulders? Like kind of grab them, you congratulate them. He pats the Prophet ﷺ on the shoulders. Because you have to understand the relationship between the Prophet ﷺ and Jibreel a.s. is one of friendship. The Prophet ﷺ alluded to this a number of times. So he's like the friend of the Prophet ﷺ. So he pats the Prophet ﷺ on the shoulders, and he says, قَدْ أَصَبْتَ قَدْ أَصَبْتَ You've done what was right, you've done what was right. Then he explains to him, 
And even for our benefit, it is explained clearly that the first bowl had honey. The first bowl had honey. And if you would have, you took a little bit from it. But if you would have indulged into it, if you would have indulged into it, your ummah would have drowned into the desires and the materialistic things of the world. It was representative of sweet, the sweetness, the temporary pleasure, the glitz and the glamour, the, the sweet temporary taste of the material things of this world. That you took a little bit from it because your ummah is meant to live in the world amongst all the blessings of Allah. And of course take from the blessings of Allah but in moderation. You know, it's kind of like that, that, that difference that they talk about, whether you uh, eat to live or live to eat. So this is the difference. That your ummah will have to eat to live, but not live to eat. That's the difference. So you took a little bit from it to signify the fact that you have to live in the world and enjoy the blessings of Allah. But if you would have taken more from it, they would have drowned into just uh, indulgence within the desires of this world. The middle bowl that you took was milk. And that was representative of the guidance and the hidayah and the khair from Allah. The deen of Allah, the revelation, divine revelation, the Qur'an, the sunnah. And this has other examples in many other places. This is why when the Prophet ﷺ would eat food or even drink water, Alhamdulillahi alladhi ata'amani hadha wa razaqanihi min ghayri hawli minni wa la quwa Multiple other duas, he would thank Allah. He would thank Allah. That oh Allah, uh, uh, he would thank and praise Allah for giving him this blessing. But when the Prophet ﷺ would drink milk, Allahumma barik li fihi wa zidni minhu. He would not only thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say put barakah and blessing in it, but he would actually say and increase this upon me. Give me more of this. And that's why in multiple dreams, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu had such a dream, the Prophet sallallahu had such a dream, Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu had such a dream, where they would see themselves drinking milk. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa explained to them that milk is representative of knowledge and deen and guidance and hidayah. So the middle bowl that you drank from until you were completely full, that was representative of the guidance from Allah. And because of this, your ummah will enjoy the guidance from Allah. The Qur'an, the revelation, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And the third bowl that you didn't even touch, and because it was covered, because of that, you didn't even know what was in it, but you just didn't feel the need to even take it in your hands, or uncover it, or look inside, it actually had wine in it. Fihi khamr. وَالْقَدْحُ الثَّالِثِ فِيهِ خَمْرِ The third bowl it had wine in it. Alcohol, intoxication. That's what it had in it. And if you would have even taken it, your ummah would have become lost. They would have lost their way. They would have become misguided. One other narration says that the people would not believe in you except for very little, if you would have taken that. Because it was representative of evil. And this is, there, there's so much to be said about here. There's so much that can be taken from this particular narration of, the, uh, uh, of this incident from the, sea, from the night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. Number one, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the world that He's put us in, there are three elements that exist in this world. There is the guidance from Allah, the deen of Allah, divine revelation, the sunnah of the Prophet Islam, deen. And that is our basis, that is our foundation, that is who we are, that is how we identify ourselves. Then the second thing that exists in this world that we have to interact with is the permissible. The permissible, the mubah. That which is permissible, halal, mubah, it's okay, it's permissible, it's from the blessings of Allah, no doubt. But it is just there for us to access and take from and benefit from as needed. And it's permissible, it's open. And we've been given a lot of leeway with that. We've been, we've been granted a lot of discretion as to how and how much we interact with that. The third element that exists in this world that we live in is the impermissible. And what's really fascinating is this, the default, even in Usul al-Fiqh when you study it, the default ruling for things is for things to be permissible, for things to be allowable. For things to be permissible, for things to be allowable. That is the default ruling for things. 
the, the, the impermissible things are actually a minority of things that Allah has created. It is an extremely small, minor list of things that is impermissible, that is forbidden. And that's why as I said before, the default is for things to be allowed. But what's very fascinating is that, first of all, it's very, very few things that have to be avoided that are impermissible. And that was again represented here by this wine, this alcohol. And like the Prophet ﷺ completely avoided it, that's what we've been tasked with. We have not been tasked with, you know, kind of poking at it. You know, we do that. We've been told, you know, alcohol is impermissible. Khamar, wine is impermissible. So can you then sell it? If you can't drink it? What if it's just a little percentage? We just keep poking at it, we keep playing with it, we play with fire. Can I put my finger in it just a little bit? Can I hold my hand over it? Can I get close to it? Can I do this with it? Can I do it? We're always poking, playing with fire. Riba, usury, interest, haram. Now we just keep poking with it. We keep playing with it. Can I? Can I? What about this? What if I do it like this? What if I, what if I, what if I just, you know, put a glove on and then play with it? What if I take a stick and then poke it with it? Constantly messing with things. When the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us a methodology here, stay away from it. Don't even touch it. And it will not compromise the quality of your life. It cannot compromise the quality of your life. Because you're talking about an extremely small minority of things. So it's just intelligence and common sense that is being taught to us here. When it comes, now, now that's the level that majority of us as an ummah that we're on. We're just trying to stay away and avoid those things that are clearly impermissible. But once we've graduated past that level, the second level is that which is permissible, that which is allowable, then even within that learning to practice moderation. As the Prophet ﷺ took a sip of the honey and then left the rest. Because I don't need more than that. Drinking more than that, taking more than that, will actually could end up resulting in, in some type of harm. And this is what the Qur'an teaches us, كُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا The Prophet ﷺ taught us that excess, when something is okay, something is, can even initially even be good, but overindulging in anything becomes harmful. The only thing that there is, that there is, is only good, intrinsically good, inherently good, no matter how much you engage with it or access it, it is only good and good and good, khair. And that is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so these are the three elements of the world we live in. And the Prophet on that beautiful night, he basically taught us all three of these things. And he taught us how to interact. He took a little bit of the honey, drank from the milk as much as he could. So when it comes to the luxuries or just the pleasures of the life of this world, even if they are halal and permissible, don't overindulge. You will get lost. But take as much as needed. The middle thing which the milk which was representative of the deen of Allah, he drank to his fill. He took as much as he could. The third thing which was the wine and the alcohol, didn't even touch it, let alone look at it. He wouldn't even get near it. That there's a profound lesson in how to live our lives on that night. And that's what was that's why the Prophet ﷺ said, قَدْ أَخَذَ صَاحِبُكَ الْفِطْرَةِ Ibrahim ﷺ said that your friend, he told Jibreel ﷺ, your friend has stuck to the fitrah. He stuck to the, the, the inherent nature that God has instilled within man. وَإِنَّهُ لَمُهْتَدٌ وَإِنَّهُ لَمُهْتَدٌ Excuse me. And he says that he is most definitely guided by Allah. And one other lesson that some of the scholars explained that needs to be taken from here is Jibreel alayhi salam says to the Prophet وَلَوْ شَرِبْتَ الْخَمْرَ لَغَوَتْ أُمَّتُكَ وَلَمْ يَتَّبِعَكَ مِنْهُمْ إِلَّا الْقَلِيلِ That if you would have drank from the wine, your ummah would have been lost and very few would have followed you. That there's a deep or profound lesson here. That if the Prophet is meant to be the deliverer of this message to people, a guider of mankind, then he himself engaging in inappropriate activities such as drinking this, would minimize the impact and the effect of his message upon the people. So very implicitly, it teaches us the lesson. Of course, the Prophet ﷺ was an exemplar of this. He was the, the model of perfection when it came to living what you preach. But the lesson is being taught to us that if you don't live what you preach, you know, not only will you be accountable before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this, but don't underestimate the fact that even the impact of what you preach to the people will become minimized because you do not practice what you preach. 
And it's a very powerful lesson in that. So now after this entire interaction happens, ثُمَّ أُتِيَ بِالْمِعْرَاجِ Then a staircase was brought to the Prophet ﷺ. This is the same staircase that all the souls of the children of Adam take up going up to the heavens. And the Prophet ﷺ recalled that he never saw anything more beautiful than, the, than that staircase. It was so ornate, it was so gorgeous, it was so unbelievable, so intricate and ornate. It was breathtaking. He was like, he just was shocked by how beautiful it was. لَهُمْ مِرْقَاتٌ مِنْ فِضَّةٍ وَمِرْقَاتٌ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ One step was made of gold and the other step was made of silver. And it was completely decorated. Another narration actually says, excuse me, um, the narration of Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu actually says, أُتِيَ بِالْمِعْرَاجِ مِنْ جَنَّةِ الْفِرْدَوْسِ مُنَضَّدٍ بِاللُّؤْلُو that he was brought with a staircase that not only was one step of gold and one step of silver, but the entire staircase was fixed with gems and jewels and pearls and rubies and diamonds from Jannatul Firdaus. عَنْ يَمِينِهِ مَلَائِكَ وَعَنْ يَسَارِهِ مَلَائِكَ On both sides of the staircase, angels were lined up. Angels were lined up like a, like a royal escort. فَصَاعِدَ هُوَ وَجِبْرِيلِ so Jibreel alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam began to climb up these stairs, go up these stairs. Hatta in tahaya ila babim min abwab sama until they finally reached the they reached a gate. They reached a door that was the gate and the door of the sky of this earth. Yuqala lahu babul hafada and the door, the gate. That is that accesses from this world into the sky of this dunya, sama'u dunya, is called Babul Hafada, the door of protection. Wa alayhi malakun, and there is an angel who is in charge of that gate. Yuqalu lahu Ismail, his name is actually Ismail. Wa huwa sahibu sama'i dunya, he is the gatekeeper of the sky of this world. Wa fi hadithi Ja'far, this part is unbelievable. In the hadith of Ja'far, that mentioned by Imam al-Bayhaqi, he actually mentions, يَسْكُنُ الْحَوَىٰ فَلَمْ يَصْعَدْ إِلَى السَّمَاءَ قَدْتُ وَلَمْ يَهْبِتْ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ قَدْتُ That this angel, Ismail, he hovers there in the sky. He hovers there in the sky in front of this door, keeping watch on this gate. He never goes up further into the heavens, nor does he has, has he ever come down onto the earth, ever, except with one occasion. إِلَّا يَوْمٌ مَاتَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فِيهِ Except for the day the Prophet ﷺ passed away. That this angel who from the, from the beginning of the creation of this dunya, whatever, however many millennia or millions of years, Allah Ta'ala alam bisawab, only Allah knows best. But since this dunya was created and this angel was appointed at that position, he never moved from that door except for one occasion when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he came down to the earth to attend and to visit the Prophet ﷺ on that day. وَبَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ And this angel, this angel, how powerful is he? And what type of a grand welcome was afforded to the Prophet ﷺ on this night? That this angel has an entire army at his disposal. وَبَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ سَبْعُونَ أَلْفَ مَلَكَ There are 70,000 angels that are assigned to the detail of this gatekeeper of the sky of this world. And each of these 70,000 angels has another 100,000 angels under his command. So Ismail has an army of 70,000 um, commanders, colonels, who each are commanders over a hundred thousand more angels, each of them. And he has 70,000 commanders under his command, and he is at the head of them. And they are all guarding the sama of this dunya, keeping separate from the sky what is from this world. And the Prophet ﷺ approaches this gate. And this is from where he enters. The journey of Mi'raj has now started. We're gonna go ahead and pause here and stop here, inshallah, we'll continue the hadith uh, next week. I apologize for kind of stopping here, cutting short, but uh, I had a couple of teeth extracted today, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here before I start forgetting what I was talking about, because I've taken a lot of painkillers, alhamdulillah. 
Um, so inshallah we'll go ahead and stop here and then we'll continue from here next week bi ta'ala may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanakallah wa bihamdik nashadu la ilaha illa anta nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk Mm-hmm.